Uh, so maybe let's just start with a question. Um, how many of you here use TurboTax this year to file your taxes? Raise your hand. Wow, that's holy smokes. Okay, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, first of all. Um, so whether you realize it or not, every inch of that experience this year, from your web browser or your mobile device all the way through the transmission of your tax data to state and federal agencies this year, happened 100% in the Amazon public cloud. And the teams did this from start to finish and moving the thousands of systems that we had and all the dependencies and all the data in 10 months time. And it's not just our TurboTax product. In fact, we've been on this journey for the last several years. Um, and in the last three and a half, we've gone from 4% of our products and services living in Amazon to now the overwhelming majority do. Um, I can mention this now because it's public information, but back this summer, we also announced the sale of our primary data center in Quincy, Washington. And if we continue to do what we've done over these last several years, well, then we are essentially out of the data center business by this time next year. And so that then begs the question, how does a 35-year-old, highly regulated, publicly traded financial institution pull something like this off? Well, so my name is Andy Palmer, and for the last three and a half years, it's been my job to advance and accelerate into its adoption to the public cloud. Um, and what I'm going to do with you today is share a few lessons that we learned along the way that really helped us unlock our potential and get this kind of acceleration. So, what I would first say is that the struggle is real. Uh, there's no doubt that the cloud is the new norm. I'm not here to convince you of that. But unless you've had the luxury of being born in the cloud, you're going to have to cross this chasm at some point. Okay? This is now no longer optional. Uh, the cloud means so much more than what it did several years ago, right, where it was often about economies of scale and resiliency. This is now about innovation and disruption. And so unless you want to be disrupted like so many others around us that have been in the last several years, you have to do this. Um, but once you're there, all the innovation that you need and copious amounts of this are simply now an API call away. Um, and also, the same competitive advantages that you stand to gain by being in the cloud are the same exact ones now that your competitors do as well. So unless you want to be disrupted, you have to do this. So why then is it so hard for some? So in my experience, it really becomes down to the transformation in how we work. So Intuit's been around for 35 years. You could probably imagine we've been ingrained into doing things a certain way for some amount of time. And for us, companies that are highly regulated, publicly traded financial institutions, we've often relied on the infrastructure teams and our data center teams to drive things like governance, compliance, security, et cetera. Um, but we know that's always come at the trade-off or the expense of developer productivity, innovation, and speed to market. And so it's, it's usually in this transition as you're beginning to flip the paradigm upside down to get all the benefits of the cloud, this is really where the struggle begins. And this is where teams like, or companies like Intuit tend to struggle. So, and it's not just Intuit. Um, if you haven't seen it already before, I highly recommend you go see it. Eric Tachibana did a great presentation at reInvent about two or three years ago uh, with his work from the Asia PAC uh, Professional Services Group where they studied this. And what they found in their research was that at any given point in time, 70% of companies trying to get to the cloud will experience a stall. And by stall, he means a period of 18 to 24 months uh, where the transformation either slows down and stops for a variety of reasons. Um, and that there are patterns to this. And if you looked it into its journey or into its pattern, it would look something like this. So back in 2013, we declared our all-in strategy. Um, and at the time, it was very much focused on broad enablement. This idea that it's been approved, it's been funded, we have executive sponsorship, 
they will come. Well, they didn't, right? Um, so in the traditional fashion of the change management adoption curve, we got our first early adopter, and that was Mint. And the teams got really organized, scrappy, and we pulled together, and we rolled the ball uphill, and we got Mint into the cloud. And there was a ton of rejoicing and a lot of high fives, but then we took a step back and said, okay, how do we take what we've learned here, and how do we apply this to the rest of the organization? And when we really started to look at reuse and durability and the work that we had done, and how could it work in service to the rest of the company, well, then at that point, we were officially uh, in our stall. Okay. So, uh, I'm gonna share with you now 10 key lessons from my point of view, uh, having led this effort, on what the things were that really mattered to unlock progress. This obviously assumes that you have all the intangibles already. Right? You gotta have gutsy leaders. You gotta have executive sponsorship. You gotta have the right people in the room. And you have to have a willingness to be bold, okay? First, so focus all of your energy on the hard ones early. Uh, this is really about maximizing and accelerating your learning. Uh, the, if you're constantly going after the low-hanging fruit because it's easy and you want a bunch of wins, that's gonna burn out pretty quickly. And so what we chose to do was not build a bunch of small ladders to the top of every single tree. We wanted to build reusable ladders to the top of the tree, or even scaffolding, if you will, that teams could reuse over and over and over again. And so to do this, we literally at some point called timeout on all the broad enablement that was happening. And we said, and we decided as a company, we're gonna double down as a group, as a collective, on our two biggest product offerings. QuickBooks Online and TurboTax. And as a company, we're gonna pick off two huge big pieces of this, and that's what we're gonna move to AWS. And so through that process, we quickly identified the things that mattered and the things that didn't, uh, and the things that we really needed to become durable. And it was through this process that you often hear about things such as patterns, standards, approaches, like templates, uh, where this really started to come about. Um, it also meant we had to start ho solving much harder problems as well, right? How do we need to do data replication at scale and, and encryption, uh, HADR patterns and automation? Uh, one, of the, one of the most reliable patterns that came out of this is something that we called the strong leg. What that meant was we would deliberately take the product or service that we were moving to AWS and run it in a single region with the ability to fail back into our own data centers within seconds. What that did is that allowed us to gain a huge amount of confidence going into our peak seasons, but also the teams a lot of flexibility as well. So you can imagine, unlike the holidays or peak season for an e-commerce company, if you miss dates with the IRS, right, someone's paying penalties, and that's not good for anybody. So, um, always, always, always balance speed, operability, and security. Another way I like to think about this one is that in every case and in every circumstance, complexity is the enemy. And in the beginning, for example, we had a lot of really good ideas on how to secure our accounts and secure our systems. But it was coming at the expense of speed and operability. So we could have hundreds and thousands of accounts and VPCs and security groups and knackles and ACLs and all kinds of ways to wrap uh, individual components. And the way I remember explaining this to my wife is imagine if it was my job, understandably, to build you the most secure house I could. I could get pretty creative too. I could have moats, drawbridge, dragons, a white wall, suddenly sounds like Game of Thrones, but and then she goes, well, yeah, I'd have to run errands, and I gotta take the kids to school, and then suddenly that story begins to break down, right? Now, security is still mission number one. Arguably, Intuit has some of the most sensitive, if not certainly some of the most unique data on the planet. Uh, so we still have to go to great lengths to protect it, but not at the expense of speed and operations. 
Uh, inversely, if you over-index the other way and the pendulum swings too much towards speed and operability, well then now you have Swiss cheese in your firewalls, lack of visibility, visibility where your data is, uh, and that's no good either. So this is just something to always really be mindful of. If you're having conversations or you're having debates that really helped us. You heard it all the time in meetings. Are we balancing speed, operability, and security? So, so no, you do not need to refactor your entire application before you move it. We spent a lot of time in the beginning going through this huge effort of service decomposition, trying to build everything into microservices, moving individual pieces at a time inside of the cloud, and that just wasn't working. Um, and I can't tell you how many times we'd be in a, in a meeting uh, with the migrating team, as I see our chief architect, Rick Maharaj, here, and listening to see the teams, their strategies and how they wanted their architectures to look. And it was always textbook, right? This is how I'm gonna use Dynamo and Lambda and SNS and SQS, and I'm gonna move this to ECS, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions, right? But you also have a certain timetable to get these things done. And so what was otherwise maybe a six to eight month migration, all of your good intentions has now blown this thing out to two years or even, or even longer. And as we all know, the rate of innovation coming from Amazon is so significant, 1,400, 1,500 features a year, that in two years' time, the landscape looks entirely different. And all of your good ideas, in some cases, are invalidated, or there's a better way. Okay, and so what we found is the right approach for us was lift and shift. Take it as it exists, get it into the cloud. Now there's a footnote to that, which is don't replicate stupid. And so if you find yourself running software that's end of life, unsupported, there's no viable pattern for it to run in the cloud, I advise you to spend some time to figure out how you can refactor those kinds of things. Um, furthermore, once you're in the cloud, the time it takes and the energy it takes to refactor and evolve your application in AWS is significantly easier than trying to do it in flight and moving it from a data center. Establish your landing zone. Don't be that guy. Uh, so, what do I mean by this? In inevitably, there's gonna be things that every single team is going to need, regardless of what their technology looks like. They're gonna need a VPC, they're gonna need CIDR allocation, they're gonna need user management, logging, monitoring. Um, and what we found in the beginning was that we were spending cycles building the same foundational things that teams needed and kind of intuitizing the experience where necessary and integrating it into our tools over and over and over again. And so for this to finally scale, we took the time to actually build and automate as much of this as possible. And we did this in a couple ways. One was during the account vending process itself. So by the time the developer even got his or her account, a lot of this stuff was baked in. We also spent a lot of time using event-driven automation so that as changes were happening into the account or new resources were getting spun up, a lot of this was taken care of automatically as well. So these kinds of things are just not context to developers and it's gonna slow them down and get in their way. And I highly recommend that you, you take the time to automate those things. All right. So, me, personally, I did not appreciate this one in the beginning. Um, it sounds simple, it sounds obvious, but you gotta figure out what the hell you're working with. You gotta go through the pain of going through your inventory, going through your CMDB, and most importantly, driving accountability. Owners, dates, dependencies, sequencing, and then ultimately what the end state or target state is for those applications. Is this thing gonna be retired, sunset, cannibalized, migrated? You have to go through this process. And not only do you have to go through this process once, this has to become a mechanism where you and your executive leaders are constantly looking at this to make sure that the wheels are turning on all the tracks. Um, you'll be surprised what we found out, uh, I'm sure it wouldn't be too dissimilar from you, is that there are actually a lot of applications that we could just retire or sunset. 
Um, and so the problem that we saw once we started this, this effort over time became significantly a little more manageable. So get, get help from, from AWS and from partners. Uh, this was absolutely vital to our success. And not just the success of getting in the cloud, but more importantly, I would say it came into, into scaling. Uh, our own resources are precious. We all have a business to run already. So trying to actually swallow the effort and the energy to go through a migration while you're still trying to build features and functionality and delight customers is extremely hard. And so this isn't just about solutions architects. Uh, between Amazon and certainly their partner network, there are hands-on keyboard resources waiting that have scar tissue on their back, who've done this with multiple clients already. Uh, and certainly as we begin to scale, we're going to DevOps teams and mission teams and pizza teams, many of whom had no experience at all. Uh, this was a huge enabler. It was like a shot in the arm of instant offense to start injecting people and injecting talent into the right teams. And then even in that same idea, beginning to cross-pollinate people as time went on, so we're building depth in our ranks and the team's ability to actually migrate. So there's a, there's a huge partner network out there today with multiple tiers, many of whom are held in high regard. And I highly recommend that you leverage it. So use a, use a migration factory uh, approach. Um, my team is small. By comparison of the rest of the engineering organization, it's infinitesimal. Um, and there was no way, even with all the right talent injected from other teams, that we were going to be able to scale a consistent method to get into the cloud. And so for us, what the migration factory was and is, is a collection of documents and resources and patterns that literally guide teams from the very beginning to the very end of their migration. And teams inevitably are gonna have the same questions over and over and over again if you've ever sat in these meetings. How many accounts? How many VPCs? Which HADR pattern should I be using? Uh, what services can I use or not use or should use? And so we took this migration factory process and then by, by giving this to the partners that we worked with, was really a critical ingredient to allow us to, to drive continuity, to build confidence in the teams, and to accelerate. At the end of uh, our migration factory, we actually invoked a validation phase that we called uh, the MVC, or the Minimum Viable Cloud. This, in the beginning, was a pretty crude checklist, and we would guide teams through this process, but it was the last step final validation before teams took traffic from customers, that they had done everything that was required of them for that to happen. Uh, again, it was really about building confidence and driving continuity and consistency in how we're deploying across all of our accounts. Um, and over time, this got better. We automated a lot of this. And not just only our ability to report uh, on the team's position of adherence, but also automating the enforcement of these things so over time we're asking dev, dev teams less and less. All right, so we heard a little bit about this in the last presentation, uh, but I, and I couldn't agree more. Use the cloud to secure the cloud. If you're doing what is, if you're doing high levels of ephemerality, immutability, inevitably the rate of change in your accounts are so significant uh, that what it looked like an hour ago, certainly to yesterday to now, is guaranteed to be different. And so if you think that you can run periodic scans and issue defects into the backlogs of dev teams, you're just gonna inundate the living shit out of them. And you're gonna slow down their progress. And I, highly, I highly, highly discourage you do, to, from doing this. And we would hear these things in the beginning. Well, why, why did you even let me do something that I wasn't allowed to do? Why can't you just prevent me from doing this or just fix it for me? And so we did. And so using some of the similar techniques that you saw in the last presentation, uh, we automated a lot of policy enforcement and governance and guardrails into our accounts. And this again is a great balance of speed, operability, and security. We're removing context, we're automating security triaging, we're enforcing compliance without the dev teams having to worry about it. Uh, 
the tools that are out there today, CloudTrail, CloudWatch events, logs, AWS config, all the ones you heard about from the last call, or the last meeting, they're, they're all made to work together, right? So I highly recommend you do that. Furthermore, uh, everything in the cloud is all API-driven infrastructure. And so questions that we've always wanted to ask for years that were easy to ask and impossible to answer, such as, am I secure? Am I compliant? These are now things you can actually begin to answer. So not only is this about using, using automation in the cloud to secure itself, but also to even report out on itself in real time, whether it's for a compliance requirement or for governance or your own internal policy or CIS benchmarks. There's vendors out there in the hall that can help you as well with doing this. Um, there's great open source projects out there today as well. Capital One's Cloud Custodian is a great, is a great way to get going uh, if you want to check them out. All right. For maximum ludicrous speed, grant your developers full unfettered access to the Amazon console. Uh, if you want to accelerate and you want innovation and you want ideation, uh, this is a great way to do it. Don't limit the full experience. Um, this was a philosophical choice that we made a long time ago. It's one of the best decisions that we ever made. Now, to be fair, there are some additional controls here. I think it represents about 3 to 4% of our total cloud spend, so it's not like it's a bunch of runaway projects. Uh, we have much tighter controls in those accounts, right? We don't allow ingress access from the internet. Uh, there are uh, certain scaling policies. Uh, we recycle the accounts every so many days and purge them, and so we're not worried about stuff being left around for too long that shouldn't be, that could eventually become a security issue. All right. So finally, for all you uh, laggards in the adoption curve uh, uh, within your own companies, assuming you've done all the hard stuff, you figured out uh, all the problems that you need to, to solve to eliminate the excuses and build the roads that teams need, and you're working with partners, uh, and you've got foundational patterns and standards, and you're still not getting quite the progress you need, uh, well, we found that diverting dollars that would otherwise go to technology and hardware refresh away from the data center and moving it to the cloud drove action. Um, and so when teams then, this obviously requires gutsy leadership uh, and boldness as well to go make a declaration like this, but this is something that we did from the very top and it had the ultimate impact to get us moving. And so when teams are faced with a decision between aging and decaying hardware in their data center, uh, or copious amounts of elasticity and scale in the cloud, well, we found that they tended to make the right choice. So, I hope that these have been of some value to you, is whether you start, or you're continuing, uh, or you're wrapping up your migration. I'm happy to connect with each of you individually directly after this, if it's around lunchtime, I I'll probably be at the nacho bar. Um, but while I'm here, I do want to send a call out to all my colleagues here from Intuit, from those watching and streaming. Thank you so much. Without your amazing contributions, we wouldn't be here today telling our story. I'm very proud to be a part of it. So thank you very much. <laughs>